So the bull went through a, fa a phase when they drafted the bull. So this bull was drafted by the Department of Basic Education. So they started drafting this bill in 2013 already. And that, uh, that we call a pre-parliament process. And so we've been involved in that pre-parliament process from 2017 onwards. In 2021, the bill was submitted to parliament. And that is where the bill is now. Um, in brackets, I say Parliament, Section 76. That refers to Section 76 of the Constitution that says um, when a bill affects the provinces, it must both go through the National Assembly and the National Council of Provinces. Other bills are uh, Section 75. They only go through the National Assembly. So that this is a side note. So that is where the bill is now. Once Parliament has passed the bill, it goes to the president for signature. Then once the president has signed it, um, all kinds of things uh, must be uh, finalized um, before the bill can um, come into force. So um, one of the things they'll have to do is they'll have to write regulations in terms of the bill that will yet determine the nitty gritty of how the bill will be implemented. There must be budget made available and all kinds of processes must be defined of how the bill will be implemented. So it could take quite a, a while from being signed by the president until it comes into force especially because one of the um, clauses of the bill says that compulsory school attendance is then extended to grade seven. So, uh, so uh, if they want to make that the law and enforce that, then grade six, sorry, not grade seven, grade R, sorry. Uh, grade R is now part of compulsory school attendance. Then they must be able to, to cater for grade R at all public schools and and there's quite a lot of budget and preparation needed for that so once the president has signed it he will he will then determine when this law comes into force and that could potentially there could be quite a a, a while between signing the bill and the bill coming into force so once everything is sorted out they got all the money for great r then the bill comes into force and then they'll start to enforce the law, meaning they will prosecute you if you not meet the requirements of the law. So where before that date, if you had a child of grade R and you didn't send the child to school, everything was hunky-dory, but now they'll have to start acting against you when your child is in, of the age of grade R. So I've also got, it, it is at that stage that legal challenges will begin. So we can all, uh, legal challenges to the bill will only start when, um, when it's signed by the president. Then we can start off challenge the, we had unconstitutional things in the bill. So, uh, so you'll see a lot of activity of uh, litig litigation activity from that moment on. Currently, we can't challenge the bill because it can still change. Um, yet um, the National Council of Province might still uh, come to other conclusions than the National Assembly. Um, but once the president assigns it, it's, it's fixed. Okay, that's just an overview. Then zooming into parliament. So currently the bill is in parliament. In Parliament, it's got to go through the National Assembly and the National Council of Provinces. It has now passed the National Assembly. Uh, we had, we've done lots of presentations on that. There was written submissions. There were oral submissions and there were public hearings. That is all done and dusted. And despite all the good presentations done, they've ignored most of the feedback and they've passed the bill. 
and pass it on to the National Council of Provinces, where it is now. So they also going to go through a similar process. They'll ask for uh, written submissions. They'll give the opportunity for oral submissions, and they'll do public hearings. Is similar than um, the National Assembly, but there are some slight differences. I'm not going into that now. Uh, if there is a conflict between the National Assembly and the National Council of Provinces, it will go through a dispute resolution process, and then it, if, if, if agreement can be reached, then it goes to the President for signature. So that's just a quick overview of the process. Okay, go to the next slide. Okay, now this is just an overview of the narratives that were used um, during the, the National Assembly um, part. So the, these uh, round one, two, three, four represent the, diff the different parties that made oral submissions in the period of uh, November 2022. So these were people that actually went to Parliament and in Parliament made presentations. So there were about five parties that talked about um, home education. The first one in round one was Christian View, very much focused on the rights of parents. The Pestalozzi Trust uh, presented on the 15th of November, and it, it, it focused on the, the fact that uh, the Bellable or the SA Schools Act, as amended by Bellable, is not suitable uh, to regulate home education, therefore we need a new regulatory framework to um, to regulate a new um, uh, education landscape. So that was our message. And we didn't present a specific solution to the problem with alternative formulations of, of Bella Bull, but we, we presented a roadmap going forward. Then around four, there was the Gauteng Association for Home Education who presented the case that home education is a natural extension of parenting and should be regulated in a similar way. And then the South National Association for Home Education also um, said they, they had a guest, uh, guest speaker, uh, Mike Donnelly from the USA, that we had gave the arguments once international recognized human rights and then they made the case that it, it, um, home education should be regulated by a process of notification and contingency monitoring. And we'll go a bit more into that uh, as we go along. So that's just an overview. And I think uh, the, 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 the perspective we had on education in this phase of, of the, um, the bellable was that... Um, Home education is, is, is part of parental care. It's something we as parents do for our children. And that's a way you can argue that is a, a valid way to look at home education. Uh, but they didn't bite uh, on that one. And I think Advocate Misser sort of uh, said, no, we can't view it that way. I can't remember her exact words. But so they said, so that's the one way of looking at home education, but you can also look at the same thing from a different view. You can see it as the right to education, as a way of realizing the right to education. Okay, so let's proceed now. So now it is at the National Council of Provinces, and it's going to follow a similar uh process than in the national assembly so it first be it's now not got a portfolio committee but it's got a select committee um select means they are they have been selected by the provinces um so so they've had their first meeting november 2024 they're going to do written submissions oral submissions and public hearings and these are just some guesstimates. So they've already given us dates for written submissions. So it's going to be December until 19 Jan. And then somewhere afterwards, there will be oral submissions. And then there will be public hearings. 
we've got no idea. Every province will do its own round of public hearings. Uh, we'll we'll see when that happens. So Mpumalanga already had its round of public hearings. Then there, it will be debated, and then it will pass, or maybe not pass, and then it will go through that dispute um, resolution mechanism. Okay. Firstly, now, um, now we're taking, uh, looking at home education from the um, perspective of its right to education. So. So a child has got a right to education, okay? That is uh, not only a child, but everybody's got a right to education. But a child cannot make decisions on education. Uh, and therefore, the, the parents must make that decision for the children. And the children's access, um, parents must guide direct and secure the child's education and upbringing, including religious and cultural education and upbringing in a manner appropriate to the child's age maturity and stage of development. So from this thing, we can then deduce that it's the right of parents to choose the kind of education for their children. So that's our first um, uh, first um, statement. Then the second sta statement is if the person has, if your parents got a right to choose the education for a child, then it's a problem that the head of department, that, that is the basically the head of department at the provincial education department where you submit your application for home education must then decide uh, yet, uh, currently it's a question you must apply for home education and it means you must ask for permission to home educate and they must now consider your application and approve or decline your application now that is a that is a problem um, so we make the argument that registration does not necessarily mean giving permission. We must, we must, we must unlink the the concept of giving permission and registration. So, so the constitution says that independent education must be registered. And registration means a mere administrative procedure of putting the name of a child in a register. But that does not give the HOD the power to override the decisions of parents. And there are a number of reasons why that, that is unacceptable. Um, so... Parents make a decision to choose home education, and that decision is a complex and multifaceted matter. It's not only about education. It's also about safety and health and personality and all kinds of things play a role. So an education official is not capable to, to evaluate and uh, and consider a complex and multifaceted manner, but based on the little information that is conveyed by means of the application form. So um, I'm just quoting something. The best interest of a child will rarely be determined by a single overriding factor. In most cases, it is required that the entire range of a child's right can be taken into account. Decision makers need to determine which of the available options better secures the attainment of the child's rights and thus correspond to his or her best interest. So, so that is the nature of the type of decisions that parents make. And, and not even courts. Even Courts are even hesitant to make decisions 
to, that, that set aside the decisions of parents. So if courts are hesitant to set aside the decisions of parents, then education, um, education officials should be even le less hesitant or more hesitant to make such decisions. The other thing is there's also a, um, a problem of independence. Um, okay, or, no, no, a problem of authority. So when everything is fine, parents have got custody over the children and they make the decisions. And it's only a court that can set aside the decisions of parents because they are the ultimate guardian of children. The High Court of South Africa remains the ultimate guard of each and every child in the person. And a education department cannot take the powers of the High Court and, 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 and set aside um, the powers that, um, that the court has. So that is that is another problem with this whole thing of that you have to apply for home education, and then they can then an education official has got the power to accept or decline your application. And then the other problem is that the right to education is limited. So one. Um, uh, so one of the things in the in the Bella Bill is that it prescribes that the per pro proposed home education program predominantly covers the acquisition of contents and skills at least comparable to the relevant national curriculum determined by the minister. So it limits what you can teach your child without any uh, reasonable you know, cause. The other thing is the, the 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 right to education can be limited, and the constitution gives us some some things uh, with which you can limit the, the right to education, and and it says um, for independent schools it says uh, you you must not discriminate on basis of race. You register with the state and maintain standards that are not inferior to the standards at comparable public education institutions. And that is a close list. You, those are the only things you can use uh, to limit the right of education. So obviously at home, you can't discriminate. You, you can't discriminate on basis of race or your own children. And registering with the state, as long as it's a mere administrative exercise, um, is, is, is not a problem. And as long as you maintain standards that are not inferior to the standards at public schools, that is the only limitations they can put on your freedom of education. So that's just an overview of the, the main problems with, with um, Bella Bull. So what is our position? Uh, our position remains the same on a high level, that fundamental change is needed in, in education because bellable entrenches and outdated educational landscape uh, from 1996. And it's not suitable for the current landscape. We need a regulatory framework that, that can accommodate a spectrum of, of uh, new education forms. Um, but what we're going to do this time is we accept that the NCOP is not going to move out of the, the current framework of, of the SA Schools Act. So as an interim measure, we do make a proposal to protect the rights and freedoms of, of the home education movement by proposing an alternative formulation of section 51, and that's what we're going to discuss now. This is a, it's probably a bit small, but um, but let's see what we can do. So, so this is the formulation of section 51. 
if a parent of a learner who is subject to compulsory screen school at compulsory attendant as contemplated in section 31 chooses to educate the learner at home such parent must register the learner to receive home education with the head of department so that is i think it's verbatim the same as the current formulation and that that removes the the um the problems in the current sa schools act which says you may register it makes clear that the, you must register so that is the main objective of this um, bill is to, to give clarity and that um, that number one gives that clarity. But then number two, we say the head of department must approve the application and register the learner as contemplated in section one if the parent undertakes to. So there's no, if you look at the Bella Bowl, there are two things. The, the HOD must be satisfied and then the parent must undertake. So we've taken all that HOD must be satisfied stuff out because it's that satisfaction of the HOD that, that gives the HOD to, to have the power to set aside the, the decisions of parents. So the only thing is um, parents must undertake certain things. Firstly, you must ensure that home education is in the best interest of the child. You must ensure that the standards to be maintained will not be inferior to the standards in comparable public schools. Now, remember this thing, the standard with... Um, you must also remember the standard of education that you give to your child is something individual. Yet, there's not a, a single standard that's, standard that's applicable to everybody. So this, this standard is uh, whatever is, is good for your individual child. And then three, provide evidence of learning or arrange appropriate assessments for submission to the department if there is reason to believe that the education being received by the learner is of an inferior standard to that in comparable public schools. So, so, so currently the Bellable says everybody must submit assessments on a regular basis. This one says only when there is reason to believe that there's a problem must you submit appropriate. And, and it depends on what uh, education style you use. Um, evidence of learning. Um, so, so this thing focuses on how do we handle the exception? It doesn't place a burden on the majority of good parents that do a good job, but it, it, it says how should you handle the exception? And then we say that the head of department may investigate cases if there's reason to believe that there's, uh, the, the standard of education is inferior. And the head of department may advise and mediate to address cases where there's a problem. But the head of department does not have the power to decline and set aside your, your decision to home educate. So they can advise and mediate, but they can't decline. If the, the head of department or the official is of the reason, it has reason to believe that home education is not in the best interest of the child, he or she may approach the court to set aside the decision of the parents to choose home education. So that is our proposed alternative formulation of section 51. Then I'm just going to go through, just going to explain a little bit. There are some, what, what are the reasons and what are the benefits of this one? The first benefit is it realized the purpose of the bill. If you read Bella, Bella Bill, you'll see there's a section 2.35 at the bottom of the memorandum. And, and it says the purpose of Bella Bill is that it makes clear that learners may be educated at home only if they are registered for such education. Um, and and, and this, this formulation, uh, the Bella Bill makes it clear and this formulation also makes that clear. So that that 
That is the main purpose of the bill, and that is also realized by this reformulation. It also meets the constitutional requirement for registration. But you remember, registration does not mean permission. It's merely putting the names in a register. And it does not, this formulation does not allow education officials to usurp the power of the courts. The courts are the, uh, the, the upper guardian of the child and not education officials. So this, this resolves that conflict. And if, and what we one have to admit, there are um, rare cases where, where home education is not in the best interest of the child and the, the, the department will always say, we care for you. And we, there are sometimes cases where it's not good and, and, and we need to intervene. Now, this proposal of, of, of the Pestalozzi Trust gives there a way to, res to address that problem by means of mediation, um, investigation, uh, and escalation. The other op option, number five, the other advantage is currently, if you, you apply for to, to home educate, and then they decline it for whatever reason. Then you can appeal to the MEC. And if the MEC doesn't agree with you, you must then approach the courts. So the, the onus is on you to approach the courts and you got to fork out the money to approach the court if you don't, if you're in a dispute with the Department of uh, ed Basic Education. This one turns that, this proposal of us turns that around. It says, no, the onus must be on the department to, to approach the courts. And I think the department will be increasingly careful to approach the courts because their, budget, um, their budgets to litigate are, are not that big anymore. And it also moves... Um, the burden of proof. So, if if the uh, if your if your application is declined, okay, they got to give reason. They say no, they don't think it's in the best interest of your child. Then you must now provide evidence. No, no, I think it's in the best interest of my child for this and that and the other. That's also why in the application form you must provide a motivation. You must motivate to them why home education is good. That is nonsense. It's you've got the right to decide what's the best for the children. They must come up with proof that it's not in the best interest of your children. So it also shifts that thing around. And then it also, number six, um, currently... The, the, the right to education of your children is limited to the contents and skills comparable to the national curriculum. That is not constitutional because the constitution says that it must be of a standard. So the contents of skill can be anything, but the standard must be, uh, must not be inferior to public schools. And then lastly, uh, or seven, um, it, it, it is designed to for, for the majority of responsible parents, it's a mere administrative procedure, and it's designed to, to, to give guidance on how to handle the exceptional cases. So it's designed to handle the exceptions and not place a burden on the majority in, in the hope that you'll catch a few exceptions by putting that burden on the majority. And then it also resolves this whole thing is with, uh, as when you apply for home education, you are sitting there in a state of uncertainty. Are they going to approve it? Are they going to decline it? What are they going to do if they decline? Whatever. That state of uncertainty is now resolved. So may, yet, um, you can continue to home educate until a court says you can't. Okay, that's just some overview of the benefits. 
So, um, yeah, I think that's the proposal we're going to put on the table. Um, and I think the next step will, that's what we're going to propose in the, in the written submissions. And we'll hopefully do an oral submission. And uh, in, people can use this in the, um, if they want to, in the, uh, in the public hearings. Um, yeah, so uh, then apart from this uh, proposal, there's also a number of procedural objections that we've gone, uh, got, and we might, might use these to litigate, but we can also mention them uh, in our um, uh, submissions. I'm not going to, this is a whole thing on its own, it's a presentation on its own. What is the procedural problems with Bellable? Um, so it's all kinds of things that the minister decided not to do. It's got to do with, it, um, yeah, I'm not going to go through this. I'm just going to show it to you. So this is the first seven, no research, no social impact uh, study. Or, or the social impact assessment was not published. And here's another list. Um, we don't know what the regulations are. The social economic impact didn't um, properly consider home education, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think that is where I'm going to stop. I've taken an hour. <laughs>